You know that guy spending two million a year trying to live forever? My name is Brian Johnson. I've been spending millions of dollars creating an anti-aging protocol. I now have the best biomarkers of anybody in the world. I am the healthiest person on planet Earth. Do you think that you're going to die? No. Really? Yeah. Surely the last one's got to be a joke. Anyway, a lot of subscribers have asked me to cover Brian Johnson and the topics related to him. So here we are. The first issue we are going to be discussing is Brian Johnson's obsession with biomarkers. I'm in basically the top 1% of every single biomarker. Before I commence my discussion, it's imperative to define what a biomarker actually is. A biomarker is a measurable indicator of a pathological or physiological process. Essentially, it's a tool that can be used to, for instance, A, detect disease such as troponin in heart attacks, predict risks such as cholesterol in the instance of cardiovascular events, or monitor treatment response such as HbA1c in diabetes. In clinical medicine, biomarkers are not endpoints. They are tools that guide decisions as opposed to defining health. And there's this interesting law that I think is relevant here. It's called Goodhart's Law. And what this law essentially stipulates is that when a clinical measure becomes a target, it ceases to become a good measure. In other words, if you start optimizing your life solely to improving a biomarker, it a loses its original diagnostic value, B becomes disconnected from real world outcomes such as actual health or longevity, and C encourages unsustainable or unnatural behaviors just to hit a number. Let me give some examples. The first one is Brian Johnson's Johnson, which he has somehow turned into a biomarker. Specifically, I'm referring to his ability to get nighttime erections that nighttime erections is actually a really important marker of health. It represents cardiovascular health, physiological health, and psychological health. In fact, it's one of the most important things anybody can know about their health. Like, put it on the same level as cholesterol and blood pressure. It's if we just stopped it here, I would actually agree with Brian Johnson. Given that in many instances, the progression of erectile dysfunction is due to insufficient blood flow to genital organs, it serves as a proxy for cardiovascular health. And indeed, there are many research papers that support this hypothesis. However, a problem arises when we view it as a biomarker and try to improve it through any means possible. Let's see what he's been trying to do. One is focused shockwave therapy. This is a technology used to repair injuries uh, like ACLs or sprained ankles, which accelerates the speed of healing. And so applied to the penis, it also has rejuvenation effects. Now, many people with ED will use focused shockwave therapy. In my case, because I have a functioning penis, it was used for rejuvenation. And I will tell you, it's painful. You may want to do it for fun, but it's generally pretty painful. Here's the issue. By artificially enhancing a health biomarker, such as nocturnal erections, whether through shockwave therapy, Botox, or medications like Cialis, it no longer serves as a reliable indicator of his cardiovascular health. Once a biomarker is manipulated directly, it loses its original diagnostic value, regardless of how impressive the results may appear. Let's take another example. It's been clearly demonstrated in numerous research papers that cellular NAD levels decline during chronological aging. And by extension, Brian Johnson has used NAD levels as another proxy for age, saying that he has increased his NAD levels from that of a 42-year-old to that of a 16-year-old. But again, this raises an important question. What is the clinical significance of elevated NAD levels? Whilst NAD levels decline with age and are often touted as a longevity marker, it's also easily boosted through supplementation. This makes it a modifiable biomarker, not necessarily a meaningful one, and certainly not proof of reversing aging. You can also find Brian Johnson's complete list of biomarkers here. Let's dissect this in a little bit more 
detail. One big issue is that these biomarkers are the best of from the last 24 months. As Joseph Everett points out in this short, it's very easy to manipulate biomarkers over a short time frame and simply showing the best results over a two year period is disingenuous and does not reflect his actual health. The same day would still be reasonable. You can change your markers a lot in a couple days. For example, I dropped my testosterone from 90% in just five days by doing a five day fast and then a marathon. My cortisol was so high that it was double the reference range. But because I was fasting, my insulin and triglycerides were low, which is good. So it'd be extremely misleading to take my cortisol and testosterone before the marathon and my insulin and triglycerides after the marathon and then say, look how good my biomarkers are. Another commonly raised concern is Brian Johnson's abnormally high testosterone levels of 841 nanograms per deciliter. Especially surprising given his vegan diet, extreme caloric restriction, and intermittent fasting. He has acknowledged this himself, admitting to testosterone replacement therapy. And when you're in that caloric deficit, your testosterone lowers. And so we supplemented it with a two milligram patches that I wore six days a week. Each patch delivers, I believe, nine IU. They're about, so it was roughly, um, yeah, six times nine, so like 50, 50 or so uh, per week. This, once again, highlights the problem of misleading biomarkers. If a hormone is being exogenously replaced, its blood levels no longer accurately reflect the body's natural state or internal health. I'd like to emphasize that for each of these biomarkers, he never actually provides evidence in the form of a laboratory test verified by a third-party organization. It's just what he claims. Everything's transparent. The reason I'm diving so deeply into his biomarkers is because they're the cornerstone of how he markets his blueprint protocol. He showcases these numbers as proof of its effectiveness, implying that the $870 per month regimen is what delivers these optimum results. That price tag includes prepackaged meals he sells, plus affiliate links to 18 different starter items, which according to him, aren't endorsements, just affiliate links, as if there's a meaningful difference. The issue is he's trying everything at once. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy, stem cells, gene therapy, plasma cells, full body shockwave therapy, you name it. On top of that, he's trying a cocktail of medications like rapamycin, acarbos, and plasminogens, many of which were already part of his regimen before achieving his biomarker levels. With so many simultaneous interventions, it's impossible to isolate what's effective. The scientific method typically involves changing one variable at a time to assess causality. Yet, despite completely abandoning this principle, he credits all the results to his blueprint stack, like baking with 100 ingredients and then insisting that the result just came from the salt. Fortunately, we have the real-world case of someone who followed the exact blueprint protocol for 180 days, Sierra Clark. She measured her pace of aging before and after the trial, and for those unfamiliar, a lower score typically indicates slower aging and is a better result. What's it look like? <laughs> it's good? No! It's not. Okay. All right. Let me process this. My score is 0 0.95. My first score was 0 0.93. My second score at 90 days was 0 0.94. And my final score at 180 days is 0 0.95. Obviously that's disappointing. The result, disappointing. Her pace of aging increased slightly, yes, but the direction speaks volumes. You may think she's the only one, she's not. There was a group founded by Johnson called BP5000. It turned out to be this study investigating the effects of the blueprint stack on thousands of people. The study was so badly managed that Brian's key doctor, Oliver Zolman, the guy who seemed to create all of Brian's protocols for him, quit Blueprint because of concerns about the study. There was a private Discord for BP5000, 
Let's go back to Joseph Everett, who managed to find one of the members and get data from the group. I was able to get in touch with many of the participants and one of them shared everything with me. He has to stay anonymous, but here's proof he was in VP5000. His acceptance email, his signed consent form, his onboarding materials, his invitation to the collection platform, and his invitation to the Discord. He shared with me the entire chat log for the side effects thread on Discord and people were experiencing all kinds of issues. Just to mention a few, there was bloating, gas, constipation, ringing in the ears, headache, nausea, fatigue, anxiety, skin issues, and many people talked about sleep problems. In fact, there was 10 times as many messages in the side effects thread than the glow up thread. So not only does the protocol appear ineffective, it may actually be doing more harm than good. One example raised by a Reddit user involved undetectable levels of vitamin B12 that had been flagged for around eight months without resolution. Normally, I wouldn't fault a protocol for lacking B12, but this case is different. Johnson's entire program is vegan, a diet known to carry a high risk of B12 deficiency. Without proper supplementation, individuals are vulnerable to serious consequences, including anemia, nerve damage, and neurological consequences such as subacute combined degeneration of the spinal cord. Another issue pointed out is the extremely high lead and cadmium levels for which Blueprint received a 60 day notice of violations of California's health and safety code. The nutty pudding and cacao powder were implicated in this instance. In excess quantities, lead can cause numerous detrimental effects, including developmental toxicity and male and female reproductive toxicity. It's also known to cause cancer. The same is true for cadmium. A major issue here seems to be that Brian Johnson doesn't seem to fully understand his own protocol or products. He comes across as someone simply following instructions, a kind of puppet guided by his team of leading researchers. In many ways, he feels more like the face of a brand rather than the mind behind it, primarily serving as a marketing role. Let's look at how he handles basic questions from Derek of More Plates, More Dates. Alpha ketoglutarate. What is the literature we're pointing to to find the utility in it to be as part of like a daily stack? I don't know. Super veggie powder. What is the differential on glucose spikes, for example? From that perspective, I don't know. Blueprint essentials. Ubiquinol. Mm. Do you know if it's bioavailable in dried format? Yeah, also, I don't know. Blueprint essentials. How do we justify this as an everyday thing that we're going to utilize? I don't know the comprehensive evidence justification for it. When someone can't confidently explain the protocol they're promoting, especially one involving health, it seriously calls into question their legitimacy as a source of information. So let's look at a few examples. One that pertinently stood out to me was his stance on olive oil, which he claims is better than a Zempic. The evidence we, we just shared about what this does, it's unbelievable uh, in the ways it improves health and wellness. It's better than Ozempic. Really? It is. Okay, so explain what Ozempic is. That's a diabetes drug that people are using to lose weight. Yeah, so it's like Ozempic is like the fire alarm. And so for example, there's a study where people lost 5.2 pounds uh, taking Evo consuming Evo for nine weeks. Not gonna lie, I love the shock look on Diary of a CEO's face. He did not believe that at all. Neither did Derek from More Plates, More Dates. And subsequently, when he questioned Brian Johnson on the underlying mechanism, he had no clue. The mechanism by which it's accomplishing the weight loss, like, is it such that it's, like, I couldn't find the study, by the way, so I was hoping you could speak to it, is, is it, or did they find that it enhanced some metabolic output or was it more that they perceived they were mm -hmm. eating the same diet but in reality it was attenuating hunger signaling dramatically and they were portion controlling just by indirect subconscious behaviors yeah. i don't know we can pull it up I, okay let's pull it up sure <laughs> let me see if they can find it yeah i don't remember what the mechanism was Anyway, let's go through the study. It's this paper. If we go into the abstract and just read the methods, you will notice two things. One, the diet was energy restricted, which by the laws of thermodynamics will cause you to lose weight. And the control group was soybean oil. So really all this study proves is that olive oil may be slightly superior to soybean oil for weight loss. 
the olive oil group lost approximately 2.8 kilos and the soybean oil group lost 1.6 kilos. The next part we're going to be talking about is rapper Mycin, which I think he's no longer a fan of. But just a short while back, he was a big fan. In this video, I think he was just a bit confused regarding the underlying mechanism. Rapamycin would probably be number one. Not why? It, uh, the evidence behind it's really good. But why? What's the... Uh, it's working on the mTOR pathway. So it's like a... Yeah, it's, it's a... It's, it's, it's a... There's details on it. Okay. Again, at this stage, I'm not pro or against rapamycin. I haven't done enough research into the topic. But in a recent video just around a month ago, he retracted his stance, saying that it caused him too many side effects. I did, however, notice side effects. For example, I'd have cankers in my mouth, or maybe a wound wouldn't heal fast enough. My blood reports show that I had cholesterol disruptions. My blood glucose spiked a little bit. And then perhaps the thing that was most painful for me, it increased my resting heart rate, which as you know from watching my videos, it is the most important biomarker I track every single day because it's the most influential thing determining my sleep quality. Now these side effects continued for several years, but again, I was willing to make the trade-off for the potential longevity benefits. The problem with his statement in general is that he hasn't followed the scientific method. Brian Johnson does 50 billion things at once, and it's very hard for someone with his protocol to determine if a singular intervention resulted in his effects. This guy's taking 100 pills a day, doing shockwave therapy, stem cell transplants, but just claims some side effects he's experiencing is due to rapamycin. In his video, as further justification, he also mentioned this new study. A month after we discontinued rapamycin, a preprint came out, which is a paper, that they were evaluating several longevity interventions, including rapamycin. It showed that rapamycin accelerated the biological speed of aging in humans across 16 epigenetic clocks. This was huge news. Now, of course, what this means is irony hunts me. We talk about this on the channel a lot, which is it's kind of the funniest, most humorous outcome that could happen is a drug that I was taking for longevity actually was accelerating my speed of aging. So you gotta give it to irony, it's pretty funny. Unfortunately, he has once again misinterpreted the research. A few things. First, the paper in question was a preprint. What that means essentially is that the study has not gone through the lengthy but appropriate process that is necessary for peer review. It's therefore important to take these findings with a grain of salt, especially considering that these articles have not been finalized by authors, might contain errors, and report information that has not been accepted or endorsed in any way by the scientific or medical community. Secondly, if you actually look at the graph carefully, rapamycin did not induce a statistically significant effect. So the effect wasn't bad, it wasn't good, it was just neutral. Guess what also had a neutral effect? A Mediterranean diet, his ideal vegan diet, exercise, and many other things. And this is an interesting comment by one of the authors of the paper in the video done by Matt Cableine on this issue. So the study wasn't even designed to evaluate the efficacy of rapamycin or other lifestyle interventions. As one of the authors clarified, the goal of the paper was to explore how responsive epigenetic clocks are to various inputs, not to assess whether interventions like diet, exercise or rapamycin work. Misreading it as proof that these interventions are ineffective completely misses the point. It's a misstep that underscores the importance of understanding both the limitations of preprint and the actual scope of the research. Anyway, I think that's enough for today. If you have any other topics you want me to cover in this space, leave a comment down below. Alternatively, check out this video I made on Dave Asprey, who also misinterprets a lot of studies and provides faulty, inaccurate advice. I'll see you in the next one.